Welcome, listeners, to this installment of Fast Food Horror, with this tale entitled The Rest Stop by E. J. Miller. There are countless scary stories I could tell here. Tales of things that go bump in the night, of things that lurk in the shadows, of goblins and ghouls and other frights. Stories of the depraved, or the unimaginable worst of the human experience only thought of in nightmares. Or the recounting of true, actual events. This is one of those. I won't tell you which, the latter or the former, you'll have to decide on your own. I'll only say that I have spoken to many people about this subject, about what I'm about to share with you, that, if it's fiction, how it should be portrayed. There are very many that are very emotional about that. And, if the story is real, way too many questions to field from the same. Here we go. I had taken my wife and three daughters down to Raleigh for a soccer match. My youngest was a very, very big Alex Morgan fan, and she was scheduled to play that night. I don't have a lot of money, and this would be the closest she would ever get to us. So, trying to be a good dad, I got us tickets. I had to cut a lot of corners to make it work. We drove halfway the day before, subsisting on two large coolers of sandwiches and other things we had packed. Stayed the night in a campground instead of a hotel or a motel, then drove right to the field that day, arriving minutes before kickoff. We took in the game, and to save cash and time, when the match was over, autograph signed, merch purchased, we loaded the kids back into the minivan to head home that night. Like I said, I don't have a lot of money. I couldn't rightly afford a hotel stay or campground, extend the minivan rental, and a day of meals since the coolers were low, so I intended to drive straight through to Buffalo. Ten hours. That's right. Sounds crazy, right? I figured with coffee and some Red Bull, I could do it. We made good time getting out of North Carolina and then on through Virginia. However, the problems didn't start until West Virginia, into the mountains, the mist and the fog of Appalachia. It made seeing very tough through those twisty mountain roads, bending right and left, then up for no reason. I knew with one wrong turn we'd be off falling into the abyss. I had to take things very slow. Well, slower than I'd like, only driving as fast as my headlights. It was also about then that the third, or was it the fourth, Red Bull started to wear off. I felt like I was going to crash. Not the vehicle. Just, I got really, really tired. So I let my wife drive for a while while I tried to nap. But about 30 or 40 minutes into the drive, she really wasn't having the mountain driving either. It was scaring her as well, the darkness and the fog, not knowing if the road was going to turn or end. So she pulled over at an overlook and woke me up. I was rather groggy, and we were in the middle of nowhere. If you want to call high up on a mountain surrounded by forest and darkness nowhere, I urged her to drive a bit further, hoping to find somewhere safer. After another fifteen minutes, she pulled off into a rest stop, parked in the rear of the lot, and we joined the girls in a nap. I set my phone to wake me up in an hour. I just needed to close my eyes a little bit longer, and then I could power through. Maybe the fog would lift. Maybe with a little bit of sleep it would be easier. Maybe the sugar crash would wear off. I remember watching one of those documentaries in school when I was a kid. It was concerning the parts of the human brain. You probably remember watching it in high school too. The cerebellum, the temporal lobe, the brainstem, and the amygdala and limbic system. 
those last two are the primal parts, the parts of your brain that automatically detect danger, the survival parts. And mine woke me up from a dead sleep. Like my body was shot with a current of electricity. My eyes flew open, and I was immediately looking around my surroundings, not knowing or questioning why, but quickly and efficiently looking all about. Not in the minivan, not the interior where my family lay asleep, but my eyes immediately began scanning what was in the woods or surrounding us. Looking, scanning with a feverish intent for the danger I knew innately was there, and then my eyes locked on it. Forty yards up the hill directly in front of us, illuminated only by the moonlight and stars, it stood, watching me watch it, watching me with a predatory gaze, with red eyes. It stood maybe seven feet tall, a large, framed, hulking thing that easily tipped the scales at 400 pounds with broad shoulders, long, well-muscled arms extended well past its waist. It was not a person. It was too large to be that, and what little I could see of it appeared to be covered with some dark fur. I could not see its face aside from the eyes whose stare had not broken from my position. I watched as it slowly made its way down the slope, long, careful strides, arms swinging corresponding to each footstep, purposeful and slow, like a lion creeping on its prey, getting ready to pounce, ever decreasing the gap. Again, that part of my brain, that primal, basic part of my brain engaged, and it screamed, Survive! I pulled my wife from the driver's side of the minivan and quickly leapt behind the wheel. She woke with a start, our eyes locked, and we both heard a howl from outside the minivan emanating from the mountain I was just watching. An angry howl. She scurried into the back of the minivan, demanding what it was in a panicked voice. What had happened? What was outside? I started the minivan and put it into reverse and gunned it, the engine's roar not loud enough to mask the roar of the thing now running towards us. As I exited the parking lot, I looked in the rearview mirror and saw it standing there, eyes glowing, chest heaving at the edge of the parking lot, enraged. A dark thing with long, muscular arms and legs covered completely in dark, matted fur. I looked back at my wife, who was holding our two youngest, our third behind her, clutching her neck. My wife's primal brain had kicked in as well, without hesitation, understanding. Protect the young. The rest of the parts of my brain finally started to kick in as we put distance between us and it. And as the questions started to flood from the rear of the minivan, of what it was, what was chasing us? The only thing that came out of my mouth was the thing that didn't sound as crazy as the truth. Because the truth, well, I said the only thing I could think of, a bear.